The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator McKim, which is also shown at item 12 in today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the, clock, the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Hanson Young. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak in favour of the motion we have before us. The Australian government has taken a big step to agree, alongside other nations, to halt extinction right around the world, to protect our environment and to look after our oceans. At the end of last year, at the Montreal COP Biodiversity Framework COP15 meeting, Australia participated in goodwill alongside all the other nations. Australia signed up to these agreements. We had diplomats there, people spent time debating proposals and clauses line after line after line. The detail, the meticulous detail and effort that was put into these agreements was extraordinary. I'd like to say thank you all to all those public servants who put in so much effort. But none of this will mean dot, Mr Acting Deputy President, until we start actually protecting the environment we have back here in Australia. You can't say one thing in Montreal and come home and do another thing here in Australia. If we really genuinely are serious about halting the crisis that faces biodiversity globally and here in Australia, we have to stop destroying our forests, we have to stop destroying our critical habitat, and we have to start protecting those very precious places that makes our country one of the most beautiful places on earth. It is madness, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we live in a country in, two, in 2023 that allows the destruction of our ancient native forests. It's not just madness, Mr Acting Deputy President, it's criminal that it is subsidised by the taxes of Australian taxpayers. It is heartbreaking to see these ancient forests destroyed simply because year after year after year, election after election after election, no government has been willing to stand up and say no. Our forests need to be protected. Our ancient forests need to be protected, and when we're facing this huge crisis of global warming and biodiversity, we actually need to protect the little that we have left. The commitments that Australia signed at this COP15, the biodiversity, the world's largest global pact on protecting nature was that we would protect 30 per cent of land and 30 per cent of ocean, and that we would make sure there was no more extinctions past 2030. I mean, frankly, I think we should be able to say there should be no more extinctions of species from today. We have already lost too many of our native animals. We've already lost too many of our native species here in Australia, and we should be doing everything we can to protect them. I mean, it is just shameful that we are facing a situation where our iconic koala is about to become extinct because we continue to destroy their homes. The Tassie devil, the lead peter's possum, the Australian sea lion in my home state in South Australia. These animals need protection. And you can only stop their extinction if you stop destroying their homes. And you know it costs money to destroy their homes. Australian taxpayers are forking out the money to allow the logging to continue in our native forests. It is shameful. It's economically reckless and it is environmentally criminal. 
It would save the Australian taxpayer money if we banned native forest logging today. Save them money. And while the government talks about environmental reforms and changes to environmental laws down the track coming soon, there is one key thing missing, Mr Acting Deputy President, and that is a ban on native forest logging in this country. And that is shameful. Thank you, Senator Hans and Young. Can I ask that you move your motion? It's not necessary to make your speech again, but I would like I would like to I would like to move the motion, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I look forward to other members in this place supporting it. Thank you very much, Senator Hanson Young. Sen Senator Rennick, I meant that in good nature. Uh, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I'm so pleased to be given this opportunity today to rise to speak to this motion. Because if there is one thing that I am incredibly passionate about, it is the environment and biodiversity. And I just don't talk the talk, I walk the walk. When I was a young lad, I quit my job when 23. I got on a plane and I went overseas. I had six months in Africa. I went to see the gorillas in the mist. I climbed Kilimanjaro. I went to see the Serengeti. Uh, likewise, I spent another seven years overseas where I got and climbed you know, Mount Blanc, Annapurna, those places, uh, and saw lots of wildlife across the world. So I'm very, very passionate about protecting our biodiversity, especially here in Australia where we do have a lot of marginal country. And I grew up on a property in Western Queensland where, ironically enough, I have actually seen the mulga wipe out the Mitchell grass. And I know what feral pests do to this country. I know what uh, you can have, um, brain snap here, uh, you can have too many um, wild cats, for example, and pigs. And you know, when I was a young lad, I don't have a gun licence anymore, but we used to go and shoot the pigs because they used to create wallows, the cats, where there's, you know, feral cats are a real problem in this country, um, but I can assure you that it is very difficult to keep control of that if you let the mulga run wild out in Western Queensland. And you know, there's photos of our property back in the early uh, 50s and 60s where it was all open grassland, and today, because we're not allowed to push, uh, the, the mulga has taken off. And one of these days, they'll drop a match in there, and the place will just burn. And if you're worried about protecting koalas and things like that. You don't want bushfires going on out there. It won't take off like the uh, gum trees and eucalypts will, because it's kasha, but you know, fires have happened out there in the past. But I'm glad Sarah Hansen, uh, Senator uh, Hanson Young uh, raised the issue of koalas, because to sit here and talk about the impact that coal mines and logging will have and not talk about the destruction of renewables uh, is completely uh, one-sided and hypocritical, because our koalas will be under threat from the construction of up to 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines that have to be built to connect the power from all of these isolated remote renewable, renewable um, energy projects. And I should say that that property in Western Queensland, we had solar panels out there in the late 80s. So I'm not anti you know, using solar panels or whatever at the end of the grid, uh, but it'll never work on an industrial scale. I can assure you of that. And then we should talk about the sea lions, because we've just seen the case in New Jersey where they're doing seismic testing in the ocean off New Jersey, and we've got a lot of beach whales as a result of that seismic testing. Now, you know, only the Greens and Labor could come up with some sort of uh, mechanical energy instrument that will kill above the water bats and birds, okay? B especially bats, which are one of our key pollinators, and then be a threat to our sea life underneath the water. And it's not just the actual wind turbines that are going to cause problem. These wind turbines are coated in bisphenol A. Now, one litre of that will pollute up to 50 million litres of water. Right? So we don't know what the impact of this stuff is going to be. They're going to have to make sure there's proper regulations when they put these wind turbines out in the ocean that this bisphenol doesn't melt or decay away uh, and end up polluting our oceans. So, so you know, in terms of the renewables, they are a serious threat to our biodiversity. And then, of course, we come back to the batteries. Okay, these are built from rare earth metals. Now, technically speaking, they're not that rare in the earth's crust, but they are very, very um, fine in the sense that you've got to actually mine so many tons of ore just to get one ton of metal. So with lithium, for example, on average, that, that grades between one to two percent of ore. So you've got to mine 100 tons of ore just to get one or two tons of lithium. 
And then on top of that, you've then got the stripping ratio where you've got to go round and round and round to get to the ore. You don't just drive those big trucks down at a very steep angle. So that, the, the, the footprint of solar panels and rare earth mining on our biodiversity is going to have a massive impact uh, on, on the potential um, you know, animals going forward, not, not to men mention the actual CO2 emissions that are going to be used in actually getting this stuff out of the ground. So uh, I think that before we uh, start turning off our coal-powered uh, coal fire stations, which, by the way, you know, the CO2 that comes from that actually is plant food. I mean, what better way to recycle energy than through the natural process of photosynthesis, something that I would have thought most of you would have understood because it was taught in grade eight science. Uh, so I Thank say, you. let's you, back Senator coal. Rennick. It's been Thank you, good. Senator Rennick. Senator Gr Grogan. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, that was quite a fascinating contribution. Um, I'm not sure where to start with it. So, um, I rise to address the urgency motion put forward by Senator McKim um, regarding the need to end native forest logging. I am proud to be part of a Labor government uh, that's committed to, a strong, to strong action on the climate to actually addressing some of the degradation that we've seen over the last decade and more, and to working towards Australia being the country that shows the rest of the world how to build a balanced energy system to protect the environment and to actually plan for the future, a future that is a net zero future. Now, we have um, in December 2022, as was referenced by Senator Hanson Young, um, agreed to some targets uh, at the Biodiversity uh, COP15. And we also have a very significant agenda to protect the environment, known as the Nature Positive Plan, which will halt environmental decline and repair the damage that has already been done by the former government over the last long, painful 10 years. If you remember the damning 2020 State of the Environment report, it was hidden, probably on top of the fire hose and underneath the pile of ministerial uh, appointments. The, it, the way that the environment has been ignored the way that the emissions challenge we have in front of us has been just swept to the side is awful. But in eight short months, this Labor government, this Albanese Labor government, has made significant inroads into trying to turn that around. We have seen so many changes that really are going to get us on the track to put ourselves in a position to be the renewable energy country of the future, which is what we want to be. And we must protect our environment along the way. And we must put it as a priority, which is what we believe that we have done here. So after that wasted decade, what we are doing in terms of the environment includes our plan for rewiring the nation so that renewable energy is able to be appropriately dispatched across the grid. We will have cheaper and cleaner power. We are looking at a nature positive plan to rewrite our, nature, our national environmental laws, which many of us are well aware have been broken for so long. We have a plan for zero new extinctions for this continent. We have a new nature repair market. We are legislating to protect the ozone layer, doubling the number of indigenous ranges, protecting indigenous cultural heritage in true partnership with First Nations groups, reducing waste, building a more circular economy, campaigning on the world stage to protect our oceans, support biodiversity and fight for a plastic-free ocean. We've already in those eight months past legislation, targeting 43 per cent emissions cuts by 2030, and we're, committing to reach, we're committed to reaching 82 per cent renewables by 2030. We've had the Chubb Review, 
that found that land clearing accounted for a significant share of our national emissions and recommended no new project registrations to be allocated under that avoided deforestation method. And it also recommended that we look at developing new methods that actually incentivise the maintenance of native vegetation that has the potential to be a forest and maintain those existing forests. We've accepted this. We've accepted this recommendation. And our safeguard mechanism will reduce emissions of our largest emitters. New projects will need to meet specific requirements, including rigorous environmental checks and adherence to the reforms that we've made to the safeguard mechanism that we're in the process of making. These reforms are important to limit Australia's carbon emissions. The reforms have received significant support from business, from industry, from environmental groups. This is going to make a fundamental difference. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. At COP15 last year, we saw on the global stage the urgent need to halt and reverse environmental decline. It was made clear at the conference, it was agreed to, and we saw the government reaffirm their commitment to halting extinction. What we need now is action. We, we don't need more plans to make plans. The thing that we have to get on with is to stop destroying areas of the environment with the highest biological value. Continuing to log native forests doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make environmental sense, and it certainly doesn't make economic sense. Vic Forests lost $54 million last year, and that's on top of a loss over many of the past years, and it's just taken out a loan from Victorian taxpayers payers for $80 million. The East Gippsland Forest Management Area, the largest in Victoria, is uneconomic for logging and has been classified as non-commercial for more than a decade. But taxpayers are still subsidising logging in these areas, areas that contain these threatened and endangered species that we're supposedly trying to save. So let's, let's act. We've had scientists tell us for decades what we need to do. When you're in a hole, you stop digging. And that's, that's the first step. We have to stop native forest logging in this country. It's no longer good for our communities or for our future. Yes, the timber industry is needed to provide the materials we need for buildings, but that can and should come from plantation forestry. In southeast New South Wales, frontier economics analysis shows that the plantation industry is worth 160 times the native forest sector and employs far more people. The economic benefit from native forests is now in other industries. We have to start to move on. We have to have more imagination for these, these communities that have been logging towns for many years. You know, to go to the, the central highlands, the value of water and tourism to regional GDP is 25.5 times and 20 times the value of the timber and wood chips. The best way to meet and go beyond the 43% by 2030 and net zero by 2050 is to stop cutting down one of the best carbon storage technologies we have. We need to stop cutting down native forests. We can have better outcomes for jobs, income generation, and avoidance of loss making that's eventually paid by the tax, taxpayer by exiting native forest logging as soon as possible. We can invest in logging towns to set them up for the future. It's possible. It's been dealt, done elsewhere. The longer we go down this, this road, the worse it is for these towns who could potentially be entering into the carbon market, tourism, the worse it is for all these threatened species that are not just threatened from loss of habitat, things like lead beaters, possum, greater gliders. But we know as we move into a warming climate, 
Many of them are very heat sensitive and we need to ensure that there are as big areas of land as possible for them to move and to, to be able to deal with the changing climate. So I really implore the government. I thank them for their commitment, but it has to be backed up. It has to be backed up with investment. We know that this is going to cost money, but it's worth it. We're investing in nature, we're investing in our future, and we're part of nature. If nature goes down, we, we go down with it. Um, there's, no, uh, you know, there's, there's no standing out, out, outside of it. So I really implore the government with the upcoming budget, invest in nature, make good on your promise, because Australians and future generations of Australians are relying on you. And when it comes to native forest logging, have the courage and have the imagination to bring forward the exit from native forest logging. Bring forward the exit to a new economy, good jobs in other industries for these towns in regional areas. Senator Green. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for the contributions to this motion. Um, I, I appreciate everyone comes uh, to this debate with a, a love for our beautiful country and our beautiful environment. And um, I am certainly one of those people, not only because I live in one of the most beautiful parts of our country, but because I'm very privileged to be the special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef and, and get to experience all of the really important work that's going on there uh, in the water, but also in the catchments. And um, I just wanted to touch on a few of the issues that have been raised, and particularly around uh, commitments that have been made um, to the international community uh, and through COP15 particularly. Uh, I, I think I... Um, uh, share sentiments of many people in the public that are just incredibly proud of the work that our government and our ministers have been doing on the international stage to return this country to the negotiating table. Um, we certainly were uh, at a position where our reputation under the former government had been um, destroyed uh, and our credibility on climate and on the environment um, had been completely, um, uh, was in complete tatters. And what our ministers um, have been able to do in various um, conferences of the parties um, across the last few months is to restore Australia's reputation. And we did that by making sure that Australia was leading from the front, campaigning for strong targets and clear measurements of progress. And by doing so, we've managed to ensure that for the first time ever, we have a global agreement to protect 30 per cent of the world's land and 30 per cent of the world's oceans by 2030. And that is an incredible achievement and something that I think, particularly our Minister for the Environment, should be incredibly proud of. To go and to restore Australia in such a short amount of time to that level of respect and ambition. Uh, now, these. Um, these targets um, are something for us to strive for, and we are doing the work to make sure that we have policies to achieve a nature-positive planet. We have ensured that our um, nature-positive plan to rewrite our national environmental laws is front and centre of our environmental policy in this early part of our government. I know that after 10 years, people in this sector and people who care about the environment are really eager to get on with the job. I know, as many people in this chamber understand, that the Samuel Review under the former government sat there gathering dust. And so I know there is an urgency felt by many people in this place. But can I assure you that this work is happening? It is happening and we are moving forward to make sure that we have national environment laws that protect our forests, protect our threatened species, protect our Great Barrier Reef and protect the jobs that rely on many of these places. We are delivering a plan for zero new extinctions on this continent. We are legislating to protect the ozone layer. We are delivering a commitment to protecting 30 per cent of Australia's land and oceans by 2030. And we're also backing this up by funding. There's $1.2 billion for the reef in the last budget alone. We are funding to save native species, to employ land care ranges, to expand indigenous protected areas and to protect in, um, against invasive species. Um, to say that we are not funding this important work um, couldn't be further from the truth. But this 
obviously gives me an opportunity to talk about um, where we've come from and what we're up against in this country. And we know that there is a clear difference between this government and what we're doing on climate and what we're doing on the environment compared to those on the other side of the chamber. Because it is very important that people in this place understand that the um, Liberal National Government, when it came to energy and climate, destroyed and delayed 22 failed energy policies. They didn't land a single one. They vetoed renewable energy projects that would have created regional jobs. They hid energy prices until after the election. They joked about Pacific Island neighbours going underwater and they sat on the Samuel Review. And they haven't changed. Now they're in opposition. In opposition, our friends on the other side of the chamber, the LNP, have uh, voted against emissions reductions targets, voted against the electric vehicle legislation, voted against cost of living relief for working families on energy, and they, have vote, they will vote against safeguard mechanisms. They continue to ignore the science. It is 2023 out there, but when it comes to the opposition, it's still 20, 2003. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I really welcome Minister Plibersek's commitment at the Biodiversity COP15 to zero extinctions by 2030. But the government now needs to act to make this commitment real. And critically, the government needs to act to end native forest logging immediately. I've only got five minutes, so I'm just going to focus on one species that we must protect from going extinct, and that's the Leadbeater's possum, or Wallert. While it live in the tall mountain ash forests in Victoria, just east of Melbourne, they are critically endangered. And the mountain ash ecosystem they live in is critically endangered. And they are the most carbon dense forests in the world. The threats to Wallert and mountain ash are logging, fires, and increased fires due to climate change. I want to quote the experts in this speech, the scientists who know these lead beaters possums, who have been studying them for over 30 years, and that's the scientists from the Fenner School of Environment at the Australian National University. They did a review of lead beaters possum in 2017, which summarised that the retention and recruitment of hollow-bearing trees is the single most important issue for managing lead beaters possum and many other threatened species, and that the key habitat resource for Leadbeater's possums, populations of higher bearing trees, are in rapid decline, and with them, Leadbeater's possum is also declining. I mean, Wallet had a recovery plan which would lay out what the actions that needed to, hap needed to happen to stop them from going extinct. It had a recovery plan between 1998 and 2002. It hasn't had one since. And why? because of pressure from the logging industry to keep logging the forests that they live in. Every estimate that I, since I've been in the Senate, and that's now eight and a half years, I've been asking about when are we going to see a recovery plan for Leadbeater's possums. There was a draft recovery plan which was released in 2017. It has yet to be finalised. At estimates last October, I asked again, I got the same lame response. Oh, the Leadbeater's possum remains a priority species. Minister Plibersek has asked the department to give it urgent focus, and we are looking to finalise the recovery plan as soon as possible. Um, Minister Plibersek, if you are listening, if you are serious about zero extinctions, there is one action that needs to be taken, which basically is what the recovery plan should summarise, and that that is that we need to end the native forest logging. We need to end the logging of their habitat. We need to end that logging immediately. The ANU review that was done six years ago noted that um, the current prescriptions are insufficient for the long-term conservation of species. The majority of hollow-bearing trees are not covered by these prescriptions, and that current logging and regeneration prescriptions do not provide ad ad adequate protection for existing hollow-bearing trees. And then note how, for the first time, the recovery of a, protected, of a threatened species, because we don't have a recovery plan, because what's happening is being guided by Vic Forests in the, in the Victorian government, they noted for the first time the recovery of a threatened species was tied directly to the maintenance of an extractive industry. And the recommendations pursue, um, 
pursue, advise pursuing a range of um, actions based on unproven recovery measures, while prescriptions likely to be effective in protecting hollow-bearing trees were ignored. They noted that the majority of science conducted by state government departments and on Leadbeater's possum and the resulting reports generally lack peer review. And yet here we've got mountain ash forests who have just got so much to offer in terms of tourism, abundant clean water, carbon storage, recreational activities, biodiversity, but the logging is ongoing. Except, however, over the last summer, because, because of successful court action by community groups showing that Vic Forest has been logging illegally, the logging has stopped. And the logging, which has been driven by the Maryvale Pulp and Paper Mill for the production of paper pulp, has stopped. And in fact, it looks like it might stop forever, where media reports in the last days have said that state government and union sources expect um, Nip and Paper Group to permanently discontinue production of office paper. So the time is now. The time is now to be protecting our native forest, to shift our timber industry to 100% um, plantations rather than the existing 90 per cent, and to be protecting our precious native forests for everyone. Thank you, Senator Rice. I intend to put the question. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. A division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the, the chair is that the question the question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Noes to the left of the chair. I appoint a teller for the ayes, Senator McKim. And teller for the noes, Senator Askew. Senators, there being 13 ayes and 27 noes, it's passed in the negative.